Welcome, this is Luke Grand from Practical Farmers of Iowa. We're really glad to have you here and definitely want to encourage everyone who's listening to put your email address and city and state in the chat box and let folks know where you're coming from and so we can all share kind of where our perspectives have us, uh, have us uh, where our state of mind is and where we're at. Um, also mention if you're, are you a farmer yourself hiring folks this summer or are you uh, a beginning farmer looking to get some experience on a farm? Let us know in the chat box at the left. Additionally, make sure to put out the number of, choose the number of folks that are watching with you tonight in the upper right, right hand corner, uh, the viewer count window. And uh, that's a kind of a fun way to let folks know uh, how many folks are watching. Let's get started. We are all here today because we care about the same thing. We care about families earning good livings on profitable farms that uh, take care of the land and take care of the animals and the people that are on those farms as well as the environment that uh, sustains the farm and sustains us humans uh, through the years. And this is just one shot of one of those farms that we, we really have a lot of respect for here at Practical Farms of Iowa, one of our founding members, uh, the Rosemans of Harlan, Iowa. Another great farm, Vic and Cindy Madsen, also in western Iowa in, in Audubon County, uh, folks that have really helped uh, guide our organization and, and be really great leaders uh, of farmers and farm families in Iowa and around the Midwest. And so we are definitely all share the common vision that we can have farms like this everywhere. Uh, in every county, we can have hundreds of farms like this if we can find ways to overcome challenges together by sharing farmers' experiences and lessons and uh, you know the successes that they've, they've had overcoming those challenges. And we all care about the environment. So here's a great example that farmers can be leaders in taking care of the environment with cover crops, but you can also do that with extended rotations and adding livestock with integrated systems and all sorts of other great things that farmers are doing all the time. So we want to definitely share those, those strategies and help other farmers adopt those practices. And we also care that at the end of the day, it's a very complex social network uh, that farmers are working in, and we need to have that social network very vibrant and folks talking to each other. So we help bring together 100 events a year, and this is just one of, one of those events that we try to help bring people together so the community can share and, and learn from each other. The, 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 cause the, at the end of the day, we all need the next generation. We all need that next uh, batch of leaders to be emerging. And so we hope to be inspiring next generation of leaders all over uh, the state of Iowa and around the country. Thanks for joining us on this spring farm in our series. What a spring we're having this year in Iowa. It's very cold and there's still frost in the ground. And uh, here we are a week into the official start of spring. And we're so glad about it here at Practical Farmers of Iowa because we have more time for farmer to farmer learning. So we thank you for joining us here March 26th to network with other beginning farmer trainees and trainers uh, to talk about uh, employees on farms as well as learning opportunities on farms. Hope you can join us next week, of course. Uh, that will conclude our Farm in Our series until next fall. So the process for this event is we'll have very brief introductions uh, from me and then also the, the speakers. Uh, we're going to have a discussion with two speakers, starting with Julius Locum and then going to Jill B. Bout. We will take questions from the audience uh, at least for a full half an hour at the end of the, of the session. So we definitely want to include your, uh, your voice in this discussion tonight. So please put your questions in the chat box uh, throughout or save them for the end, whichever you feel uh, better about. We will conclude promptly at 8.30 p.m. And uh, definitely are very glad you're all able to join us. Um, and while you're joining us for a farminar, think about joining us as a member of Practical Farmers of Iowa. We have a very low, low uh, membership fees, but you will find that the, that value is very high with uh, our great focus on farmers and sharing farmers' stories. Uh, for just 20 bucks a year, a student can be a member of Practical Farmers of Iowa, where the whole farm family can be a member for just $50. So it's a great value. And you get some really great discounts, discounts to all of our events, as well as getting uh, all the publications and uh, front of the line treatment for any special opportunities that might come the way of Practical Farmers of Iowa. If you're not convinced yet, please join our Facebook page and like us and check us out. We'll send uh, updates every day and let you know what, what new things are going on at Practical Farmers so you can uh, kind of feel us out a little more and see if it's a good fit for your organization. We guarantee you will like it. And uh, so please like us on Facebook and follow our updates. If you're in Iowa, we've got some great cover crop field days coming up March 28th, April 1st, and April 4th. If you're interested in learning more about cover crops, we've got some great farmers uh, as leaders who are leading those events to help uh, share some strategies and tips that you can uh, adopt this great conservation practice to your land. 
Uh, the dates and times are on the screen there. You can click any of those links to learn a little more about those events. That is all I have. Thank you very much for coming to this great seminar. And uh, let's start with Julia. So I will pull up your slideshow, Julia. And you may begin. 30 minutes. All right, great. Um, hi, uh, my name is Julia Slocum. Um, I'm a beginning farmer here in Ames, Iowa. I'll be starting on an acre and a half um, just west of Ames of vegetable production um, with a 30-member CSA and uh, selling at the Main Street Farmers Market. Um, so I've been, I guess just I'll tell you a little bit about my background and how I came to farming and um, I'm kind of the first probably two-thirds of what I was planning to talk about is directed more towards um, young or beginners who are just starting to work on farms, you know, what to, what to think about and what to expect. Um, it looks like some of you already have a lot of farming experience and um, are maybe more on the employer end of things. So if you want to stop and ask questions about the farms that I've worked for or, you know, specific things about how they've managed employees and that sort of relationship, that's, that's perfectly fine. Some of this is a little squishy. Um, yeah, so I've been interested in farming for several years before I realized it was a legit career path. Um, I was living and working in D.C. and going to farmers markets uh, on the weekends, and I had a garden with my housemates. I didn't have any serious growing experience at all. Um, and one weekend I went out to this bluegrass festival near Shenandoah National Park, uh, where I met two resident organic farmers who were working for an environmental organization out there. And I just completely fell in love. Um, a year later, I moved to Iowa and worked with the Conservation Corps of Iowa doing prairie and woodland restoration and discovered um, that I just really loved working outside all the time. And uh, from there, I took the leap into my first farm job. And this first job was on a goat dairy down in New Mexico where I uh, assisted during kidding season and worked in the creamery making fresh shed and hard cheeses. Um, from there, I went up to Wisconsin to live and work at a 19-acre vegetable farm. They had a 318-member CSA doing uh, home deliveries to the Twin Cities. Um, there were five other people on the crew, and uh, the farm was really education and production oriented. Um, one of the farmers has his PhD in something like plant biology, and they'd both been farming for about 17 years. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about um, that experience here in a bit. And then the next year, the season of 2012, this last season, I worked at One Step at a Time Gardens in Kanawha, Iowa. Um, and this farm is smaller. They have 125 members CSA and um, two trainees, plus some hourly folks who have worked at the farm pretty consistently over the past few years. Um, this farm was wonderful, a lot more people-oriented. Um, and they were and are really connected to local food as a movement. So that was a really interesting um, side to the farm that I didn't really experience so much at Foxtail. Um, it was also really valuable to learn more about growing a farm in a less urban market since most of Foxtail's members were in the Twin Cities. Um, so last summer, actually, we got to June and July and had more time than tasks to do. I don't know if it was we were ahead of the weeds because of the drought or what. Um, so I was given most of my Fridays off, which I used to go volunteer at or visit several different farms. Um, between my first farm in in 2010 and February of this year, I visited or worked at over almost 20 farms around the Midwest, which has been a hugely valuable experience. And now, like I said, I'm starting my own operation this, uh, this spring, like any moment now, <laughs> once the snow melts. Um, so that's my background, and I'll just jump in here. Um, these are some of the questions um, I was invited to um, address this evening. Um, and I'll just start with the, the first one. So what are the qualities of a great farm worker? Um, I guess based on my experience, I'd say farmers are looking for a lot of the same things any other employer is looking for. Um, and these are ideal traits and not necessarily ones that I possess, um, but just things that I've noticed and I'm sure all of you have um, noticed as being valuable qualities in a, in a worker. Um, so to start just this, you know, being a hardworking and willing, <laughs> willing worker, uh, of particular importance to a farm operation is aiming for speed and efficiency. Um, at Foxtail, our battle cry heading out to the field to weed or harvest was both hands. 
um, we get so used to using our dominant hand for everything, we don't realize that we could almost double our productivity on a task like weeding or picking radishes if we use both of our hands. Um, I think <laughs> one of the farmers almost made me cry a couple of times picking strawberries. Um, it's like, no, really, both hands all the time. Um, another part of this is, you know, when you're doing the same motion thousands of times, all these small movements, I think Elliot Coleman called them 1% add up to a lot of time. So it's really important to think about setting things up efficiently and positioning yourself effectively. Um, and we can talk, I mean, this is probably a lot of things that, you know, farmers who have been doing this for a while, this is old news, but for somebody who's just starting to work on a farm, um, you know, they're, um, I had a yoga teacher once who said, uh, when he was describing a new pose that we were, we were attempting, he'd say simple but not easy. And I think that's a, um, a really great phrase that it applies to a lot of things in agriculture. Um, let's see, is it going to move? Oh. OK, yeah. And then the next point is just being positive and having a sense of humor. Um, things obviously don't go smoothly a lot of the time on farms, and it's really important to be able to roll with it. Um, another time at the farm, uh, it was during like July or August, and they call that time at that farm the heart of darkness because it's, um, you know, everybody's tired and it's hot and everybody's getting stressed out and kind of cranky. And um, and I remember one day we're in the back of the truck going back to the pack shed, and one of the farmers said, "You know, what really matters at a time like this is that you stay positive." And the other farmer interrupts her and says, "You know that? No, that's not what matters. What matters is that." Even if you're feeling more negative than you've ever felt, you still do the work. Um, and I thought that was, you know, two really different perspectives, but both valid. Um, but I will say, having a good sense of humor makes you a lot more fun to be around in the field. Um, humility was the third thing on the list. Um, you know, and this is something that I struggled a lot with when I first started farming. Um, I think it comes down to the that idea that the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. Because um, when I, you know, had worked on one vegetable farm, they kind of won me over to their way of thinking. And then I'd go to another farm to work or volunteer. And it was kind of easy to assume that if I saw somebody doing something differently, it meant that they weren't doing it right. And, um, you know, and that's completely wrong. <laughs> um, there are just so many reasons for doing things differently. and you know, time and resources and priorities and a perspective or philosophy of farming. Um, so for people who are just starting to work on farms, try to stay open as you approach different people and businesses. I think we'll all learn a lot more that way for sure. And the last point, I was I went up to Foxtail actually to visit the farmers that I worked for a couple years ago. Um, and ended up talking with a bunch of people who have worked for them in the past. Um, and one of their former employees shared this thought with me. Um, he said that he thought a really important quality in a good worker is to not judge the task. Um, you know that every everything that you are asked to do on a farm matters to the success of that operation. Um, you know they're not going to farmers aren't going to pay their employees to do stuff that that doesn't matter. Um, and kind of to illustrate this point, um, when I was working there, we had to, uh, well, if it was a rainy day or we couldn't get into the fields for some reason, they'd send us down to the barn. Um, and they were renovating the barn. And we had to dig these holes that were like five feet deep. And um, that's actually a picture on the slide here. Those are my feet looking down into the hole. Um, so like it was just wide enough for me to be able to wiggle down and keep digging this hole. And it kind of sucked, really, um, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. <laughs> and, um, but I went back, uh, like I said, just two weeks ago. And you can see next to it, um, well, this is like, had the process about a year ago when they were, you know, a year after digging these holes, they had put new supports in the bottom of the barn. Um, and yeah, so it had all these new pillars. And now this last two weeks ago, I was back there. And they've laid new cement. Um, they've made a, a four-season pack shed and um, this root cellar that has like three different cooling sections and storage facilities. And it's big and it's beautiful. And they're switching over to a winter CSA. And um, you know, and it was I didn't have that vision when I was digging that hole, you know. 
And um, so I think, yeah, I guess that's just to illustrate that point of like, you know, everything that you're being asked to do on a farm is mattering to that, that operation. So the next question was how to, how to prepare for a farm work experience. Um, when I first moved back to Iowa and seriously started talking about wanting to farm, Luke actually lent me a book called um, You Can Farm by Joel Salton. Um, and it was a good read. Uh, one thing that really struck me was a pretty pointed question of his. He said, um, OK, so you think you want to farm. Um, oh, him being Joel Salton, not Luke. <laughs> um, but he said, OK, so you think you want to farm. What are you doing right now to make that happen? And I thought, oh crap, he's right. You know, if this is something I really want to do, um, then I need to start preparing myself right now. But how do you prepare? Um, you know, for I guess a lot of a few of the people watching um, this seminar, you know, you've already taken a few steps down the road. It totally depends on your situation, but um, you know, it could mean joining a CSA and getting a work share, or volunteering at a farm, or listening into these seminars. Um, you know, I started listening to these farminars like over a year before I'd worked on a first farm, um, just to get an idea of what the issues were facing farmers and what you know how how people were talking about these issues. Um, going to conferences and field days and finding books recommended by farmers and um, you know, and I I also think part of it starts before you even set foot on a farm. Um, you know, when I was living and working D.C., you know, thinking about where I bought my food. Um, you know, if if you're committed, like we have to be committed to supporting local growers ourselves if we expect other people to purchase our food when we grow it. Um, it's really inconsistent to want and expect people to buy your products if it's not something you're willing to do yourself. Um, another thing that I wish that I had started earlier is starting to keep track of my personal finances to figure out what I need to live on and what I spend my money on. and. Um, I think those are, those are all skills that I'm needing to learn a lot more quickly now. And I'm not sure how many of uh, the beginning farmers out there have actually signed up for a job this season, but just a, um, you know, thinking about what your goals are for working on a farm and um, you know, what you're looking for in an experience as far as location and market and type of operation, the type of work environment, the size or scale of the operation, what their vision or mission is. Um, you know, what's the farmer's view of their relationship with their employees, and that does and does that match what you're looking for in a working relationship? Um, let's see. And then just um, a note on finding internships. I found pretty much all of my jobs on the ATRA database. I didn't put the link on here, um, but it's a really fabulous um, database for finding sustainable ag apprenticeships, um, volunteer and paid. Um, and then there's woofing the willing workers on organic farms. I've not done that. I don't know. Some of you may have. Um, but PFI and the Women, Food, and Agriculture Network are also great resources. I hope I'm not talking too fast. <laughs> um, OK. And then um, I guess just the last note on that with um, some, some tangible preparations. Um, you know, just being sure that you are physically prepared for working well on a farm. You know, making sure you've got rain gear and comfortable sturdy shoes that have good support, um, gloves and long sleeves and a hat. Um, I know a lot of folks like to go out with sunglasses, a tank top, and some sandals. Um, you know, and that's cool if, if you want to do that, but um, it's, there are a lot of hours of exposure. Um, you know, I'm a big proponent of good sunblock and a water bottle. Um, we moved around so much at the first vegetable farm that I worked at that uh, I actually wore a camelback uh, for most of the season until it started to leak because um, I was afraid I was going to forget my water bottle somewhere. And it was perfect. I don't think I got dehydrated once that season. Um, I think valuing self-care during the season is something I've learned a lot about from athletes and my time in the Conservation Corps, but not so much from farmers. Um, I think taking care of yourself is really important. Um, that's enough on that. The next question was uh, how to get the most out of your experience. Um, and here's just a list. Some of them are more obvious than others. Uh, a couple of folks I've worked with have been great at keeping a small notepad in their pocket at all times. Um, 
I know I saw a band of Wabi Sabi Farm with some index cards clipped together at a field day. I don't know if that was just for the field day, but I thought that was a really great idea. Um, you know, whatever works for you to, um, uh, you know, <laughs> every day, he says, you're fabulous. Um, yeah, whatever works for you, you know. I um, It's always easy to think that you're going to remember something, and um, I so often forget. Um, another uh, point is just, you know, when you meet somebody doing something that interests you, and you say, like, oh, hey, I'd love to check out your place sometime, totally do it and follow up. Um, it's so valuable to see other ways of doing things, and um, these people are such a great resource when you start out on, on uh, when you start start out on your own. Um, and I think as a beginning farmer, this is really the time to start building your network. Um, you know, some of these people that I talked to three years ago are um, the ones giving me advice on plant spacing and mulch now. <laughs> so I think you know, the more people you can talk to, the better. Uh, there are a lot of really great resources out there. Um, books and publications like Growing for Market and Farm Blogs, and there's actually been a lot, it seems like a surge in books written by beginning farmers about their beginning farmer experience, um, or their, the Turn Here Sweet Corn by Tina Diffley. Um, there are a lot of books out there to just kind of get a sense of the farm life sort of thing. Um, uh, keeping a brief log of what you do every day, even if it's just um, a plain calendar and you write weeded carrots or picked winter squash or, um, you know, I don't know, what else do you do on a farm? <laughs> um, yeah, but I think keeping a log is, uh, you know, increasingly being recognized as a really important aspect of running a successful business, um, this record keeping, um, but also just remembering what has happened in the season because I, 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 I think I'm going to remember, um, you know, and it's mid-April, and by mid-May, I have no idea whether that was Tuesday or three weeks ago on Monday. So, um, also when a, you know when you're sitting around at your morning meeting talking about the task for the day, and the farmer asks for someone to help with something, jump at it. Um, you know, all of us on the crew wanted to drive the transplanter and and learn the ropes of a funky cultivator, but. Um, there was some silence and we needed to shovel composted turkey manure pellets. Um, I think it's really important to, to take it for the team and that's how you get the full experience. Um, also just getting out of your comfort zone and we can talk more about that later. Um, and building a real relationship or friendship with your employer and your coworkers because I mean these people are going to be your colleagues in a few years. Okay. What gets in the way of having it? Oh, this is a, a great quote from uh, uh, Growing Harmony Farm, Gary Guthrie. I thought that was pretty great. Um, I was telling Luke I had to resist the urge to make this whole slideshow one of baby goats. Um, I think I did all right. There's only one baby goat in this whole thing, I think. Uh, all right. So then. Um, roadblocks to having a good season. Um, I actually pulled this first. Um, point from a farm in our a few weeks ago with a <laughs> oh I can do that we could have a whole farm in our own cute baby goat pictures um, let's see yeah so a few weeks ago Chris Blanchard had a fabulous farm in our on irrigation I highly recommend you look it up and listen to it um, one of the points he made really struck me called um, and it was just this difference between being stressed and being distressed um, you know, that stress is normal when you're working on a farm, and distress, you know, it might be common, but it's not necessarily normal, um, or healthy, I should say. Um, you know, the first, like, 50 times I got on the, the cultivating tractor, I, I um, you know, was having crazy nervous sweat and <laughs> was, was, you know, really anxious. It was just going to, like, suddenly, like, I don't know, do a 180 and flip over on me or something, you know. Um, being nervous is normal, but being completely freaked out is not normal. Um, it's also not okay if you feel very unsafe. Um, so I think it's important to be, you know, to push the limits of your comfort zone, but you have to be your own advocate as well and not do something that you feel is really is unsafe. Um, I know the cultivator wasn't going to flip over on me. I just, um, that was just me being panicky. 
Let's see. Yeah, and there are a couple of great quotes from Wabi Sabi Farm and Growing Harmony. Okay. Does anybody have questions at this point? We're good. Or this is all the squishy stuff I was talking about. <laughs> okay. Um well, and then just kind of um, switching gears here um, and addressing more of the farmer employers out there, um, you know, how, how farmers can make time for a better learning experience for their employees and improving the employee-employer relationship. Um, you know, these are, I'm going to talk about some things that I experienced as an employee, and I just want to say, um, so this is my first season, and um, I don't know how they managed to make all the time they did, um, you know, the, the amount, you know, with everything there is to think about, um, I feel like these, the people that I have worked for the last couple of years just really value the education of their employees. And it, now that I'm starting to enter their shoes, my mind is completely blown. So um, there are some crazy gurus out there. and. Um, I think there's a lot we can all learn from them. So I'll just start in on this list here. <laughs> I'm sorry for all the list. Um, but um, the first uh, point on respecting time. Um, so when I was out working in DC, I had a manager tell me once, uh, there are two things that you never mess with. You don't mess with people's time, and you don't mess with people's paycheck. Um, I think that having a regular schedule is really important. Um, you know, let's see, at, at Foxtail, we would start every day at 7 or 7.30. It was it was a regular schedule each week. Um, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, we started at 7 a.m., 7.30 a.m., oh my goodness. And then Thursday mornings, we started at 7 a.m. Um, every day, we had a break at 10.30. Somebody would run in 15 minutes ahead and scramble up some eggs and put some toast in the toaster, bread in the toaster. Um, and make coffee and we'd go in and have a half hour break we called it second breakfast and it is by far my favorite thing in the world because I'm always hungry at 10 or 10 30. <laughs> um, so we all so we we always knew we were going to have that break for a half an hour every day and then we would go back out to the field and work and we'd come back in um, somebody would go in to make lunch it would be usually about three o'clock they'd ring a the dinner bell you know and we'd have an hour for lunch and then we'd go back out to the field and we'd work until 6. Um, we hardly ever went over 6 o'clock. If we did go over 6 o'clock, they would um, make it up to us the next day, like within a couple days. Um, if they let us off early because, you know, something was happening and we couldn't do what we needed to do or it was, you know, crazy lightning out, they'd either let us off early and we wouldn't have to make it up or we would have a porch talk, which I'll... Um, talk about here in a little bit, but I think having that consistency made it made us so much more productive and motivated while we were in the field. Um, we knew we were going to have time off, and we knew how much time we were going to have off. That's when we'd make phone calls, go to the bathroom, fill our water bottles, get a snack, um, and the rest of the time we were, you know, totally gung ho. Um, next point. Um, all the farms, well, so the two vegetable farms I've worked for had an employee manual of their expectations for the season, a job description, and a signed worker agreement. I think that's really great. I mean, some people think it's um, maybe too formal and stuffy or whatever, but um, I think having those clear, clear outlines of, you know, what you're going to be doing on the farm and what is expected of you and what you can expect of your employers. Um, you know, it, it eases a lot of attention there. Um, setting goals with and for each employee and checking in during the season. I, checking in is so hard. Um, and I think employees really understand that. But, um, you know, even if it's really brief, I think um, that's just a really valuable process. And I, something I was just thinking about on the drive over here, too, um, you know, as employers, so one of the farmers at Foxtail saw that I was really nervous around equipment, and he kind of made it a goal for me that season to get me more comfortable with machinery. Um, so, I, you know, maybe 
when you sit down to make goals with employees, think about ways to challenge their weaknesses but bolster their strengths as well. Um, I don't know uh, what else to say about that, but I, I, I really, I really um, got so much out of him making that part of his mission for the season, and I'm so much more comfortable with machinery now than I would have been if he had said, okay, Julie doesn't like tractors, so I'm not going to put her on tractors. Um, yeah, so I really, I really appreciate that he saw that as a teaching opportunity. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. So I mentioned porch talks a bit ago. Um, so talking about like learning opportunities on the farm. Um, like I said, one of those farmers at Foxtail had his PhD in like plant biology or something. And um, if it was raining or you know we were pretty well caught up, we'd have an afternoon, um, you know, three hours talking about um, soil biology, or we'd go over a, um, a past soil test, you know, like break it down, what does it mean, and then talking about, you know, what you do for applications. Um, let's see. Um, they, they shared their financial information with us. They talked to us about um, what our, you know, what type of operations we wanted to do and help us think through those. and. Um, you know, some uh, talking about managing cover crops and um, managing pests. Um, I don't know, all, all sorts of topics. Um, and then at one step, they were also really great about sharing records. You know, this is how we make our seeding chart. This is how we figure out our field plan. This is our crop rotation plan. Um, this is, we had an afternoon where they talked to us about um, their taxes. Um, and that was really helpful, just like, you know, thinking about those um, really practical issues that you don't really think about when you think, oh, I want to be a farmer. Um, so I think that was, that was really valuable as well. Um, let's see, going down the list, walk-arounds. I love walk-arounds. I hope that everybody does walk-arounds with their employees. Um, once a week um, on both farms, um, we would walk around the fields and um, the farmers would say, okay, what do you see happening here? Um, you know, are there pest issues? Is, is there weed pressure? Um, you know, what's the next step here? Um, are they ready to harvest? Um, like, does it need more irrigation or, you know, and they would put us on the spot and we'd have to think about not just like, oh, they told us to go weed, but like, do we need to weed? <laughs> um, and that was really helpful in getting us to the next level. And I think, too, just um, making us feel more, um, let's see, more a part of the farm, not just an employee, but, um, you know, a more meaningful role in the farm. And I think that that was really important, too. Some more of that squishy stuff. Um, let's see. Um, oh, and at one of the farms, too, the, the farmers um, printed out a blank map of their fields. And on a Friday afternoon, we would just um, take 15 minutes and walk around and take notes. Um, and they would go off and do other things. Um, and that was really helpful, too, because then you had more time. You didn't feel on the spot. You could get a little more creative um, and, you know, had some breathing room, you know. <laughs> didn't have to worry about giving the wrong answer. Um, so that was really a, a great idea, too, especially if you've got, you know, a crazy long to-do list. Um, as long as you sit down and talk about it afterwards, I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, having clear communication and expectations, a shared language. Um, this is just a note. Um, let's see. I've found that sometimes when I am moving slowly out in the field, it's because it's not because I'm lazy or I'm tired. It's because I'm not a hundred percent sure what the mission is. Um, it's because I'm kind of confused, I guess. Um, and, you know, it's like you're driving down the interstate and you're not really sure which exits you're supposed to take. Like, you're not going to be going 80 in the left lane. <laughs> um, so um, this shared, shared language is really important. And I guess my example of this is, um, you know, you want to send people out to weed. Um, you know, you need to weed the carrots. Well, do you want people to um, be super nitpicky, or do you want them to, you know, get 
just get the big stuff going to seed or something in between. Um, and I, at, at Foxtail, they'd say hand weeding for really nitpicky weeding. They'd say hand, to, they'd say weeding for something in between, and they'd specify, and they'd say roguing for um, going out and getting the big stuff. And you know, I think it cut down a lot on the confusion. You know, you, you knew what your mission was when you got into the field. Um, and that's just one example. I'm sure it could be applied to a lot of the other tasks that get done on a farm. Um, let's see, sharing records we talked about, um, asking employees about their plans and helping them think it through, kind of playing devil's advocate, um, opportunities to manage. Um, I got a couple of examples of this. Um, at Foxtail, uh, the farmers didn't do farmer's market. They um, would send, we, we rotated between all of the crew. Um, so like one or two of us would go every Friday, um, and that was a really great learning experience. It was extra income for the farm um, and great, great management experience for us. Um, another example is at one step, um, they started experimenting with something new. They'd um, turn management of the crew over to one of the crew members for a day or maybe a week. Um, towards the end of the season, you know, we'd kind of gotten into the flow of the CSA and, um, you know, everybody had an idea of, you know, how, how they wanted things done, you know, but as far as thinking through, like, okay, we're harvesting carrots now and next we need to wash potatoes and after that we need to get out there and, like, get some more onions and then we need to get some garlic from the barn and, you know, just um, when you get put in a management role thinking about, keeping momentum going throughout the day, thinking about the task that you have to do next. Um, and I think that also um, really changes how, how you work on a farm. You know, you're a lot less likely to, to slow, down at, <laughs> um, slow down at the end of a task because you, you see the list of 10 other things um, coming up next. Um, let's see. Space and free reign for projects and experiments. Um, you know, I was usually pretty wiped out at the end of most days, but there are some employees, like the guy in this picture, who had endless energy. Um, you know, he he was growing mushrooms in the bottom of the barn. He started a composting tea experiment where they let him um, put different concentrations on different parts of the bed. And you know we were supposed to observe what differences we saw, and um, you know started worm casting projects, and uh, learned how to weld, and made his own wheel hoe, and you know just that the farmers were so um, open and encouraging, and could lend resources when they could, or put him in touch with people to you know you know help him figure out how to weld or whatever you know like um, they they could yeah give him some um, some of the space and resources he needed to do his experimenting. And that really supplemented his experience as an employee at Foxtail. Um, you know, I think, yeah, I think that's a really great, um, really great thing to do if you have the time and energy to do that. Um, you know, or just the, the uh, patience and <laughs> not being concerned about um, uh, just not being concerned about them, they'll be fine. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, and letting people make mistakes. Um, I feel like I had another really great quote here. Oh, that was the great quote. Yeah, from Wabi Sabi, um, about letting people make mistakes and learning from them. Um, you know, obviously, I think he pointed this out too in the email, but um, you know, obviously not taking out a whole bed of cash crop, I think, was the example. Um, um, but that's, um, you know, having, having the freedom to make mistakes is really valuable as well. Um, okay, I think that, that those are all of my lists um, for now. So if you guys got, have questions, that's great. Um, otherwise, I'll just turn it over to Jill and we can chat more at the end. And I think I went over. <laughs> I'll wait just a second and see if anyone has questions. Oh, 
Oh, and I would say too, um, you know, I'm here in Ames. If any of you guys are ever in Ames and want to meet up and, you know, talk about the season or um, grab a coffee or come help me on my farm, <laughs> that would be amazing. I'd love, I'd love to meet and chat with any of you guys. I feel like this is a really self-absorbed, you know, this is what I've learned. But I'd love to hear more about your guys' experience and um, the, the sorts of, you know, management tactics you use and what you've experienced working on farms. So, um, yeah, just definitely email me or, or something. That'd be great. It's all you. All righty. Well, I think I can take about a third of my presentation out and just say, yes, what Julia said, do that. that she has great, great examples and great uh, experience at a lot of different farms. Um, my name is, is Jill B. Bout, and I and my husband, Sean Skian, farm at Bluegate Farm in southern Marion County, Iowa. Um, just a, a kind of a brief overview of our farm. Uh, we started our farm in 2005, so we're still uh, relative newcomers to farming. Um, we left uh, theater management jobs in Texas and moved back to Iowa to family land um, to become chemical-free vegetable farmers of all the strange choices in the world. Um, when we started, we were we were exclusively farmer's market. Our second season, we added a small CSA. And we hi hired our first employee in 2006, so just a year into our farming operation. Um, on our farm, we are, as I said, predominantly a produce farm. We've, we're four acres of produce. And then we also have pasture timber. We raise laying hens, honeybees. Um, we have a young and coming orchard. And we also do alfalfa hay. Um, and then we also produce value-added products like jams and jellies and hand-spun yarns. So we're a fairly diverse operation. Our current crew description, um, we have, in the time that we've had employees, had everyone from 16-year-old neighbor farm kids to uh, adults in their mid-50s who were either teachers wanting a job for the summer or um, just people who were who were looking for work at that time in their lives. Uh, we have a non-residential crew. We don't have um, staff housing on the farm. I wish we did, but but we don't, and that's that's been its own challenge. Currently, um, I guess for the past two seasons, we've had two full-time people and two part-time people on our field crew. Our crew generally starts. Uh, Mid-April, sometimes early April, depending on the year. And we go through the end of October with pretty standard hours. And then we offer them all uh, very reduced hours for November and December. And we finish up our season the week before Christmas. Our field crew is all hourly. Um, we do file governmental paperwork on everyone, so we're above board on that. Um, we do hire some contract labor for some very specific tasks, like some of our mowing. We have some work for share arrangements with some of our CSA members. And we've also had a number of volunteers on the farm. So sometimes our farm crew is, is pretty tight, all employees. And sometimes it's a wide range of people. We, because we're non-residential, we stick pretty firmly to a Monday through Friday eight-hour day. We do. Um, make arrangements with our crew at the beginning of the season, letting them know that we will have two Sunday work days that are um, focused on two on-farm, large on-farm events that we have on Sundays throughout the season. And we try and trade that out with comp time the following week uh, to make sure we're not running them too hard those weeks. Um, Generally, our day starts with what we call a front step meeting. It sounds a little bit like Julia's front porch. Uh, where we go over what we're going to do for the day. And then the crew heads out to work. I generally am out with the, with the crew in the field all day. Um, and you can see the, the list of things that is kind of an average day for the crew, depending on the season. Um, we do have uh, a pair of our farm crew that works directly across the street, or lives directly across the street from our CSA, one of our CSA drops. So one of their responsibilities is taking the CSA drop at the end of that day. Um, as I said, we do uh, contract out some work that's, that's pretty specific. Uh, but most of the work on our farm is, is accomplished by us and by our farm crew. 
And I would say, uh, much like Julia said, the ability to work and a willingness to work is the most important thing we've, we've found in our farm crews. Our other desirable characteristics, um, our farm crews have to be hardworking individuals. And we've discovered over time that stamina is much more important than just hard rock strength. I found it a little strange a couple of years ago. I realized that, that over the years, we tended to have very tiny statured women working for us. And as a small statured woman, I thought, I need to hire some great big guys to just haul off on some of these tasks. But the thing that we've discovered is the stamina to work a whole day out in the sun is much more important than the strength to pick up a tub full of something. So that, that hardworking stamina is important for us. It's also important that our crew members be observant, be curious, have a good sense of humor, and I, I really should say a great sense of humor because I find that critical, that they be self-motivated and also have the ability to be both a leader and a follower depending on the task and the situation at hand. And as you see the pictures scroll by on the various slides, these are all employees that have been with us um, sometime since 2006. Um, we're a pretty hardworking farm. We, we run a pretty pretty tight ship, I would say. Our farm crew is small, and we expect a lot out of our crew. Um, we expect them to be on time, and we found that we um, need to uh, give them the definition of what we feel on time is. It does not mean that you're pulling up the lane in your car at the designated hour of starting the day. Um, we expect our crew to wear appropriate clothing, and there again, we've, we've had to work on some definitions. Uh, we expect our crew to be able to work as a team. We expect them, as, as they're in the field, to be observant and to communicate. And um, that not just means chatting out in the field, but if they notice that the seedlings are getting dry, or if they're in the high tunnel, they need to notice if the seedlings are getting dry, or if the high tunnel um, needs to be uh, have the excuse me, if the high tunnel sides need to be rolled up, if there's a problem with the irrigation, if there's something eating the chickens, I need them to be able to notice those things and either act on them themselves or communicate that there's an issue. Um, I like my crew to ask a lot of questions. And I like to be able to ask of them a lot of questions. But it's important to me that they know when is not a great time to ask questions? Five minutes before we leave for a CSA drop, not a good time to ask about soil fertility. So we, we like them to have a little judgment there. Um, Julia had a, had a great little spiel about self-care. And we expect our crew to take care of themselves. I, uh, I'm not terribly good at you know, making sure I drink enough during the day. I'm even worse at making sure that my crew drinks enough during the day, or that they're not drinking too much the night before they come to work. So um, it's important that we all um, take good physical care of ourselves because it makes our jobs easier. And our jobs are hard enough as it is. Oh, Laura, I love your no exposed midriff rule. My rule was, if your grandfather appears, he does not need to see the tattoos on your tummy. But I, I think that's good. I like the no exposed midriff. Um, we expect our crew to participate in taking care of the tools that they use and the facilities that they work in. Um, I hate going to get a hoe and finding out that it's been put away muddy. Um, or that you know they've left, there's a big mud smear in the middle of the packing shed that's slick and a hazard. So we like our crew to to take pride in those things. And um, this is also something Julia touched on. I need for, for our crew to feel that their job working for us is a priority and that our farm is a priority to them. And on the other side of the equation, I make it a priority to make sure they get paid in the manner to which we have committed to paying them. So because I make it a priority to to hopefully take care of the crew and pay them. I need for them to have a priority of, of being at work and, and doing the best job that they can. Uh, we like to think that there are some benefits to working at our farm other than payroll. Um, we do start our employees a little above minimum wage. It'd be great if we could start them higher, but that's where we are. 
and uh, we give them 30 days as a new employee at $8, and then we do a review. And if we can, we like to be able to bump those wages up, but they have to earn that bump. Um, we, we don't just give it because we think that they're you know nice and have a nice smile. Um, we make sure that excess produce, eggs, honey, anything that the farm produces, if we have excess, that we make that part of their package that they get to take home. Um, we do have a fairly diverse operation, like I mentioned before. And so we like to be able to share um, the experience of doing those things, of handling chickens, of if they have an interest in beekeeping, going out with Sean and working with the hives, um, of participating not so much in our hay operation, but um, wild harvesting. We do a great deal of wild harvesting on the farm. So learning about those things and, and actually being able to participate in, in a lot of those additional experiences. Uh, we think networking is very important, both within the crew, with the farmers, but also with the other organizations that we're involved with. Um, obviously, PFI is a big part of our farm. Um, the Women, Food, and Agriculture Network, um, Farm Crawl, which is an event that we participate in every fall and involves a number of other farms in our area, and the Gang of Four, which is um, a group of four PFI farms that all work together through the season. Um, we like for our crew to be able to interact and participate in as many of those opportunities as they can. Um, Agro-tourism, we do Farm Crawl is the large event that we host on our farm that's open to the public. And that gives our crews an opportunity to, to see the farm through other people's eyes and see how people who aren't used to being on a farm interact with a farm. So that's fun. And we also, um, in years where we can financially absorb it, we like to, uh, to provide it a year-end bonus for any of our employees that stick with us for the entire season. Um, I like to think that we've had a number of successes with our personnel. Over the years, um, we've, as you can see, we've had a number of employees come back for multiple seasons with us. I think that, that that indicates that we're giving them a good experience and hopefully just that we're not the only work out there available. Um, we've had several employees who worked for us go back to continue their college degrees. Two of those have been in agriculture. We like to see that a lot. We've had two of our crew members go on to manage university or community gardens. Um, which we think is great. We think the farm is great training for that. Um, we have crew members who have come back to work as farm sitters for us when we've had to go away for um, either a family emergency or uh, a little vacation during the winter. We feel like our crew members have been well enough trained that we leave the farm to them um, and go out of state. So I like to think of, of that as a success. Um, this past summer, we had some, some really significant health issues on our farm that entailed um, my having to leave the crew unattended, sometimes very suddenly, throughout the season. And for the first time ever, our crew without supervision transplanted a number of crops on their own. And I'm a bit of a control freak, so that was very hard for me to, to just turn over the maps and say, you guys know how to do this. Go out and do it. And when I came back on the farm, they had done a, they'd done a great job of it. And it gave them the pride in having done that and uh, reminded me that, that I need to let the crews do some things like that and take over, like Julia was saying, some of that management. So that was, that was a great experience. Um, and some internal promotion. Uh, we've had a, a crew member who's been back multiple seasons that we're now in the process of trying to work her up into a management type position on the farm. So we like to see those things happen. But as for all of us, there are always those challenges that balance out our, our successes. Um, just finding employees has historically been an issue for us. We're in a very rural area. There aren't um, great sustainable ag programs near enough to us since we don't have on-farm housing. Um, so finding employees is always a challenge. And then when we do find employees, um, a number of times they've been uh, young people, and this was their first job, at least their first job not working for a family member. And so there was a lot of remedial work that um, really needed to be done as far as um, helping educate them as to how to be a good employee and what does on time mean. Um, and uh, 
the next line in the in the challenges list that appropriate clothing yeah those no bear midriff things and there are a lot of people that come out to our farm and have this image in their minds that they're going to run their toes through our fertile soils while they work barefoot or in flip-flops and our farm is built on an old farmstead there is no way people are walking barefoot in my fields that just scares the daylights out of me nails exactly nails and horseshoes and axe heads and all the scary things that might appear on an old farmstead um, but and not just footwear but as Julie was saying you know well covering clothing hats um, sunscreen we work during the winter warm enough clothing layers so that's that's historically been a challenge for us and uh, and we continue to to try and enforce some some assistance for our employees on that front. Uh, physical and ergonomic choices. Um, I'll point you to the photo on that page. That photo makes me crazy for so many reasons on this list. Um, clearly, the girls are picking up something that is really too heavy for them. And uh, so that's, that's not a great choice. I was not in the barn when this took place. Um, and I don't know that you can see it very well, but just below that, that tub, you can see that one of them is wearing uh, loose kickoff type shoes, which wouldn't be my first choice for a day when we're looking. Thank you. Yes, the loose kickoff shoes um, isn't my favorite choice. It's fine for harvesting uh, tomatoes or something, but it's not great for a day when we're loading things. Um, and the third thing that you don't really see in this picture is the fact that the third crew member is taking this photo. So rather than helping the girls lift something that is clearly too heavy for them, uh, she chose to take a picture of it. So um, that has a little bit to do with the uh, close to the bottom on the list of the hiring a bully issue. And we'll go back to that later. Um, response to negative stimuli. This is the silliest thing, but it's, it's long been an issue for us. And I don't know if it's just because of the individuals that we're hiring, but we're a chemical-free farm. And there are a lot of bugs and amphibians and crawling and flying things on our farm. And people get really freaked out about that. And we have a couple of high tunnels with nice plastic, you know, soft plastic walls. So when one of the crew has a spider walk across her foot and screams and flails about with a four to six inch harvest knife, that's a problem. It's not only a problem for their safety, it's a problem for the high tunnel safety. Um, and random screaming on a farm alarms me. So we've, we've tried to find humorous ways to kind of curtail the um, too much excitement about things that we should expect to see, like bugs and frogs and salamanders on the farm. Um, time management is has been an issue for us. And part of that is is um, I've not developed really strong methods of, of helping our crew manage their time. But we did have a very specific instance where we had a crew, a small number of the crew were picking uh, edible flowers to go in our salad mix. And I was working in a different part of the field. And I happened to look up. And two of the crew members were sitting on harvest stools, picking away with two hands. Um, and the third member was laying completely flat on the ground on her side. And I thought there was a problem, so I stopped to watch her. And then I realized she was just kind of laying there chatting with the other crew members. And I looked down at my watch, and I happened to watch. And it took her 22 seconds to pick one flower to go into the salad mix. Um, and that's a problem for me. So at the end of the day, uh, we had to have a discussion about it should not take 22 seconds to pick a flower, one flower. Uh, so time management and finding ways to address that um, and make it a positive experience has been a challenge for us. Um, Probably our number one single challenge, uh, other than the finding employees, has been that on, on one of our crew years, uh, we hired an individual who turned out to be kind of a bully. And it wasn't something that I identified soon enough. Um, and it was someone whose personality I wasn't all that excited about. So I found lots of times to work in other places. 
and how I realized later that uh, this crew member was actually bullying the other members of the crew and that they were starting to really um, take it personally and it was becoming kind of a toxic work environment with that individual and I spent way too much time realizing that that was happening and, and not enough uh, immediate action nipping it in the bud. So that scenario played out over a long period of time, I'm afraid, and took, took some real uh, grasping of, of the situation and identifying it with that individual and basically giving them um, my way or the highway type of option. And it did, the situation improved, but um, that was very much my fault and and I needed to have dealt with it much sooner so um, that's that's an issue that I didn't anticipate happening and was one that has made me much more sensitive to um, dealing with some of those personality issues up front rather than letting them uh, stagnate through the season but the thing about all of these challenges is that I feel like they've all worked to make us a better manager and I see we've got 30 minutes left. I am just about wrapping this up. I think I have uh, one slide after this. Best practices, and a lot of these were things that, that Julia brought up and have come up um, in my earlier slides. But you know, show up, everyone, both the employee and the employer. Show up physically and mentally and be ready to be there. Um, start and finish together was a lesson that I learned because in the past, I would often, as the workday finished, cut the crew for the day, and I would stay on the field and work. And what I realized was that I was missing out on some really valuable time just walking back, putting tools away, walking back to the house with the crew to kind of take their temperature for the day, to summarize the day, to address what we might be doing tomorrow. Um, that's, that's valuable team building time that I was missing out on. So that's something that, that I'm making an effort to really attend to this year. Um, those ask questions all the way around, ask questions of the employees, the employers, but know when is the time to say, that's a great question and I will deal with that first thing tomorrow, but we can't do it right now. Um, taking advantage of those additional opportunities. Um, one of my big things that I like to suggest to uh, beginning farmers is trade talk for time. Um, when you contact a farmer, and this happens to us a lot, and say, I'd, I'd really love to come and see your farm, that's awesome. And we love to go see other farms. But understand that you're asking the farmer to take time out of their work schedule to attend to, um, to, attend to you. And um, a way that we came up with to approach that when we were learners was to say, I would love to learn you know, this from you or talk to you about your operation, is there, do you have some grunt labor kind of thing that I could come and help you with um, so that we could chat while we're working but I don't take up your time. Um, I think valuing other people's uh, expertise and time is really critical. Um, I'm a big fan of sharing favorite resources, but there are so many spectacular resources out there right now that there is no way we can all be on top of them. So. I like to share it out, um, our favorite resources with our employees, and find out what theirs are, and find out what interesting bits of information they've gleaned, um, because I don't have time to read all the great blogs and books and, and, and out there. Um, and especially if they're beginning, aspiring beginning farmers, they may have um, resources that I haven't heard about. And the last thing that I have found worked well for us in a situation where we're having some challenges uh, with an employee, especially a young employee, is to tell them um, in a private conversation, I assume you don't intend to work for me forever, and I assume that you would like to have a good reference when you decide to move on to another job, and currently I am not able to give you a reference that you would like to use. So here are some things that I would like you and us together to work on so that I can give you a good reference a good reference. I will always give honest references and I expect the same when I call for a reference. So here's this situation, you know, how can how can we amend it? And I think that helps them look beyond the work today and using this as a stepping stone onto what they want to do in the future. Ooh, I like the farm book club idea. That's awesome. 
We may have to try that one. Um, these are some things, just quickly, that we are working on for improving this year that we have not done in the past. Um, I have never had a posted weekly schedule. Obviously, CSA days, we harvest for the CSA. But we're going to start having um, uh, priorities for the week and, and a list of things to, that need to happen and uh, kind of empowering the crew to know if I don't happen to be there for whatever reason when they hit the farm, they know to look at that list and be able to take the next step forward. Um, we're going to have some posted daily duties that are the before you leave the farm at the end of the day, these five things need to happen and have some assignments on those so that people are responsible for them. Um, again, we're going to start and end the day with that front step meeting, making sure that I'm spending uh, time with the crew, uh, face time with the crew, top and end of the day. Um, I love the idea of having written goals, both from the farmer and from the crew, and having those be private between the crew member and the farmer, but also having time to discuss the ones that they want to discuss in the group. I think that's a brilliant idea, and we've not done that in the past. Um, because we have so many people returning uh, this year, we had preseason meetings with all of our employees. And we were able to go back to our veterans and say, what are things you can think of that we can improve on for this year to make this year better? And we had some really great feedback from, from both of our veteran members. Um, and obviously, we can't have a, what should we do better than last year? for our new members, but it gave us a chance to talk to them and, and really suss some things out as we move forward. So um, those are all things that, that we're implementing this year that we hope will, will improve everyone's experience. And I believe that that wraps it up for me. So I saw there were some questions zooming past. I love the idea of the Farm Book Club. That's brilliant. I don't think Julia's mic is on, so I'm going to take the one about um, letting different people take a leadership role. I think that's a great idea. Oh, there she is. Um, and we have done some of that both in the field and in our packing shed. And it's something that, especially with veteran members coming back this year, um, we plan to do more of. Um, going back to Luke's question about self-care, can am I on? Is that right? OK, cool. Um, I, I think that one of the reasons that Foxtail um, set up their day the way they did is so that they could build that self-care into their day as well as the farmers. Um, they always 99% time break with us. Um, and I think that that helped them, you know, they were definitely going to take the break because they had promised us we were going to get a break, right? Um, and then they were also taking that social time with us. You know, things can get tense when you're out in the field. You know, people, there are strong personalities and personality clashes. And being able to just, like, go and sit and drink some coffee on the porch with them throughout the day can ease some of those tensions a little bit. Um, and Luke, you had also had a thing about um, asking about the 22 seconds to pick a flower situation. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, the, um, well, the, uh, another foxtail-ism was um, if you don't kill one or two plants, you're not moving fast enough, um, which definitely doesn't fit everybody's philosophy of farming. Um, but, I, you know, I don't think we ever sat, like, any time out in the field. Um, because if you were sitting or even, like, getting on your knees, you probably weren't moving quickly enough. Um, and I think that that's, you know, something, I don't know, not going to fit with everybody's philosophy of farming. Um, and then one other thought was, um, 
one of the kids I worked with at Foxtail is now hiring two interns this year, or trainees, I should say, not technically interns. Um, and he's giving them, a, uh, I think each of them, a $100 allowance where they can pick books to go in a library that he's going to have on the farm. So he's put it into his budget, and these are resources that are going to stay on the farm for future interns. And I thought that was such a fabulous idea, you know. Every beginning farmer doesn't need to go out and buy the organic farming manual, but having that to look through is, is really helpful. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> Looking at some of Laura's comments, I think she's exactly right. I think we have historically made it a little let it be a little too informal that that um, everyone can decide how how tools work best for them and how best to use them. Um, but the thing that I've recognized is that not everyone knows how to find the most useful way to use a tool. And trying to standardize some of those movements and processes in the field is something that, that I think we're going to look more at this year. I think that's definitely true. I um, and there are other many times that a farmer would say, you know, Julia, maybe you should try it this way, and I'd try it that way. And it, I, you know, it takes you a while to catch on to a new way of doing something. Um, and so I would try it their way, and it wouldn't really work. So I'd go back to doing it my way. But ultimately, I think in pretty much every one of these situations. Their way was definitely faster. I just needed to get over the hump. You know, I needed to be motivated to figure it out and make it work for me, but I also just needed to give it a little bit of time. Um, I think an example of that is like vacuum seeding. Um, so clumsy and awkward, and I tried it once, and I was just like, Ugh, whatever. I'm just like, I can go just as fast if I just poke the holes and drop the seeds in. And that is so not true. <laughs> you know, like, once you figure it out, um, it's just a lot faster. Um, so I think that kind of comes back to the humility thing. Like, as a beginner, recognizing that these people have been doing this work for a really long time and they know what they're talking about. Ooh, safety meetings. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what you guys do, Jill, but um, before we got on tractors, um, they gave us a 10 ways a tractor can kill you talk, <laughs> which may not have helped with my anxiety around <laughs> machinery. Um, but I think that that was um, probably really wise, um, given that most of us didn't have any tractor experience at all. I think work, people who haven't been around machines working around machines is incredibly dangerous, and um, and I've been on some other farms that I think they need to do a lot more. You know, even just even if the person who's on the tractor knows what they're doing, people around them not being aware of their surroundings, walking too close. You know, um, if you're loading brush into the um, the front bucket or something, and um, you know, people just like getting too close is a big issue. Um, I think that's. Uh, there needs to be a lot more education about tractor safety. Um, one other part of that is we, um, you know, any time we were doing, if you were driving a tractor, any time you were doing anything, you shouted it. You know, so we'd shout moving, we'd shout stopping, we'd shout um, when we were lifting or lowering the tractor, um, especially when we were doing like transplanting and there were people on the back. Um, you'd say, like, coming up, you know, um, just so that everybody around knows what's happening. But, you know, things happen so fast. I don't know. Jill, do you guys do safety stuff? We don't do a formalized safety thing. But that said, our crew doesn't ever run the equipment. Um, first of all, we are predominantly manual. So um, when we do use tractors, when we do use the skid loader, we drive them. Um, and even our, our BCS, our walking tractor, um, 
is is a piece of equipment that I operate rather than the crew. So um, we've talked about being around, especially like the skid steer, because uh, the operator is blind in some areas. But we really haven't had to address that issue as far as operators. But I'm I think that that's probably part of our uh, standardized things that we need to add in for that. And yeah, Luke, that's a really good question. And I know he's on right now. At least he was earlier. Um, in the June and July heart of darkness, um, we, I think, try to say hello to each other first thing in the morning. And um, uh, do you want red sauce on your pasta at about 9.30 at night? And that might be most of the interaction that happens uh, in the heart of darkness at our house. Um, and that goes back to the self-care thing. Um, as I said, we had a pretty challenging year this year, or this past year, and uh, I think it has allowed us to start to uh, reprioritize some things and, and try and make more time um, for each other and for ourselves, regardless of the time of the year. I think that's something we just need to be more attentive to. And just a note, um, there are, uh, let's see, so Fox, both of the farms that I worked at were run by couples. Um, and I think that's a really interesting dynamic to see. And I think um, for those of you that are farming as couples, um, let's see how to say it exactly. <laughs> um, it's easy to like get, if it, well, it depends on your personality. Um, um, and I think the two farms I worked at were kind of two extremes. Jan and Tim are work so well together and are so patient, and um, you know they they just work phenomenally together. And I don't know if that's like, <laughs> if that's like attainable for most people. Um, but being able to see that interaction of like how do you resolve conflicts as a couple in a farming operation. Um, you know, I, I was like, we were living in the same house at Jan and Tim's, and we lived really close to the farmers at Foxtail, and they had a bit more um, fire in their um, their debates about, you know, what should happen when. Um, and I think, you know, if you're comfortable with it, and, you know, letting, especially beginning farmers who are going to be entering this um, this line of work with a partner, um, I think it's really helpful to let them in on that a little bit. Um, you know, maybe let them join in some of your um, your conversations when you're figuring out what to do in the weeks to come. I think that's a that's a. I think a lot of people know that um, uh, like farmer relationships are some of the um, you know most likely to not make it. <laughs> um, and that's really scary for a lot of beginning farmers that are going into this with a partner. Anyway, sorry, I feel like I'm using a lot of words there. Wow. <laughs> Never really thought of myself as a queen bee. I kind of like that, but he's definitely a darling transplant. <laughs> and yes, way too squishy. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> this would be the digression of the Farminar. <laughs> <laughs> I have a whole farm and I have farm puns. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are we? Luke offered the question about going back and revisiting the question about leadership roles. Uh, I think it's a great idea. I think we've done a little bit of it, but probably not enough. But I think, yeah, that the the whole idea that it gives a different perspective, a new light, maybe some new zest to projects. And I think it also allows um, the crew the opportunity to see that, wow, sometimes leadership kind of sucks. <laughs> it's, it's pretty easy to... Uh, to criticize when you're not in a hot seat, I think, and it, I think it gives everyone a better appreciation for, for the dynamics of that. Yeah, absolutely. Have you heard of, um, I have a friend who's always talking about decision fatigue, have you heard about this? That like there are only a certain number of decisions a person can make in a day, and after a certain point you need to start consuming um, more sugar, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I like that theory. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was helpful. So keep some um, sweet granola in your pocket or something. It'll help you. I think that's. <laughs> I think when I hit my limit, that just means someone else has to make the decision. Mm, take a vote. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Um, this is not related to the leadership question, but going back to something else we talked about, about um, uh, making goals um, between employees and employers. And at one step, they actually posted my the goal. We had sat down and talked about my goals. And one day, I was walking back into the house, and um, Jan had actually drawn really beautifully with all these markers, a very colorful um, uh uh, lots of pictures representing my goals that um, she put up on a door that we went in and out every day. Um, and uh, I don't, that really touched me, and um, it was a great daily reminder to me, and I felt also to her and, um, and to Tim, and I hope they don't mind me talking about them all <laughs> left and right here tonight. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, it made me feel like they were really taking my goals seriously, which they were, um, and it was just a really great reminder to me as well. And um, so I thought that was a, a, a good, maybe a great practice, not necessarily best practice, but a great practice. there any other questions out there? I don't know. This has been really fun. I'm really glad I had the chance to come and chat with you guys. And um, it's been great hearing Jill more about your operation. And yeah, it's been really fun. I always love seeing the little typing message down in the lower left-hand corner. It's like so much suspense, you know. What are they going to say? <laughs> Sean S. is typing.
Thanks, folks, for coming. I just wanted to thank our speakers, uh, Julia and Jill, and uh, all our funders, the Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Program, and a bunch of other great folks that were on the screen earlier. Uh, thanks all for joining us, and join us next week for the final Farminar of the Spring series, as we're going to talk about hiring employees by the books. We're going to have four experts from all the different regulatory agencies in Iowa that folks have to work with to make sure they're in compliance with all labor laws. We're going to have two farms talking about all different kinds of hiring scenarios, uh, youth, uh, as well as uh, migrant seasonal crews, contract laborers, employees, the whole gamut. We're going to talk about it for 90 minutes to next week, Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Thank you very much, Jill and Julie. I hope you have a great night, and uh, we'll see you on another Farminar soon. Thanks, everyone.